since um, you're obviously the more scholarly type, because you came back for the third lecture, let's talk about something, uh, uh, something deep and profound. The largeness of mind and the smallness of mind. There are two meanings to largeness and smallness. One is literal. A large mind means a mind with a large capacity. A small mind is a mind with small capacity. And that can be either quantitatively or qualitatively. You have a mind that is large in capacity in that it can keep going deeper on any subject, it can dig deeper. It can get more subtle. The process in that is that you discover an idea, and every idea exists in a certain context. So for example, the story of Adam and Eve, you read it, you understand it, you know it, you get it, but then you can go deeper. Going deeper would entail taking it out of its immediate context and finding the core principle that can exist in almost all contexts or in many contexts. So when you get to the core of an idea, it is liberated from the particulars, from the context in which you found them. Of course, if you uh, study Medrash or Talmud, you start off with a certain point, and all of a sudden you're talking about something completely different. But it's the same principle. That's called abstract thinking. You're not stuck in the particular context in which you discovered the idea. That would be a large capacity in quality because if you can understand the concept only in its context, it's not the full quality of the idea. There's also large capacity in quantity. A person can think many sides to an argument. A person can think many thoughts and contain them all. Of course, not at, not at the same time. That's called manic. But when you can contain, you can house a lot of information, and it's all at your fingertips, it means you have a large capacity in quantity. Smallness would mean either in quality or quantity. You can have a smallness in quality. Everything is taken literally. You can't get past the context to the core principle of the idea. And you can have a small quantity capacity in that only one idea at a time. You can't, you can't be asked to study two subjects or three subjects. You don't have the capacity. That's one meaning to smallness and largeness. Another meaning has to do not with the size of the mind, but with its relationship to emotion. Smallness of mind would mean that the mind thinks in relationship to a feeling. His mind goes where his heart takes him. Now in the extreme, it would mean that his mind has no opinion of its own. It exists only to justify the feeling. So if I love you, then I will find good reasons to love you. If I don't love you, I can't think of a single reason. If I hate you, I'll come up with brilliant reasons to hate you. If I don't hate you, then no amount of intelligence is going, to ch is going to introduce hatred. So my mind cannot go very far past the emotion. You also have it in a more subtle form. It's not that your mind is a slave to the emotions, but your mind is influenced by the emotion to some degree. It's not completely free of the emotion. That would be called smallness of mind. Another form of this would be 
when a person studies a subject because he wants to get to the emotion. The subject has emotional significance or impact. And in order to get to the emotion, he studies the subject. So he doesn't have the emotion yet. It can't be controlling his thinking. But his interest is to get to the emotion. And he's using the mind to get to the emotion. And that could be very good. In fact, that could be very admirable. You are supposed to have a certain emotion. Love God your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. You don't love him. Well, then study the subjects that will cause you to love him. That's great. You have to love your fellow Jew. You don't love your fellow Jew. Well, there are certain things you can study that will move you towards that emotion. So when you're doing that, it's the mind pursuing an emotion. That would be called smallness of mind. Largeness of mind would then be studying a subject, understanding something purely on its intellectual value and on its intellectual uh, ground. Even in Torah, you study Torah not because you want to be inspired to do the mitzvah. You study Torah not because you want to be inspired to love God. You're studying Torah because it's Torah and you need to study it. That would be called largeness of mind because then the mind is free of any influence or concern of emotions. That can also be bad. Because as we've spoken before, every valid, legitimate concept, every true idea demands an emotion. A subject that demands no emotion is not a true subject or you don't really understand it well. So purely academic is not, is not kosher, is not so good, because it's removed from the human arena. No human being is purely academic. Yet, intellectually speaking, a person who can study a subject for the pure pleasure of the knowledge that's called bigness of mind. There's another level, which is the level of sheer genius, that is described this way. Knowing the experience of getting to know something, understanding, grasping an idea, is composed of two parts. There are two parts. There's the information that needs to come down because it's above you, you don't know it. And then there's the vessel that needs to receive the idea and contain it. We find, for example, a person who is a real chacham, an inventive mind, will come up with a brilliant idea, a brilliant solution to a problem that no one else can solve. And he gets very excited. The light bulb goes on in the brain, and he knows the answer. The pleasure is immense. A moment later, he forgot what it was. It slipped away. He's got to calm down. He's got to settle down. He has to relax and hope that the idea comes back a little less exciting. Because the first time, he got it. He did find an answer. But in the excitement, it slipped away. Because it, it started to come down, and then there was no place to go. <laughs> it's easy to get there. The parking is hard. So the idea got there, found no place to park, went back, slipped away. So when you have the idea, you also need the vessel that, that will contain it, that will house it. And then you have the idea. Not it occurs to you, you got it. 
So you see that there are two parts to understanding. Now, there are people who have very inspired minds. Ideas come to them easily, but they don't have the vessels to hold it. So they will come up with one brilliant idea after another, but it never amounts to anything. They move on to the next thing. The idea doesn't build. So they have good insights into a whole bunch of subjects, but they don't know anything. They haven't mastered anything because they don't have the vessel to contain information. So they jump from one brilliant idea to another on inspiration alone. Then you have people who have the opposite. They're not so brilliant. They don't get these flashes all the time. They're not bombarded with ideas from someplace behind or beyond the mind. But every idea they get, they get it thoroughly. Because their capacity, the vessel, is very refined. It's clean. Every idea that comes in settles in and becomes a fixed, permanent feature in the mind. Actually, Hasidus says that every time you strain to understand a subject, you create a crease in the brain, physical creases in the brain. So a new brain that hasn't been used much <laughs> won't be very creased, won't have too many uh, lines. But a brain of a, of a real student of a person who has used his brain intensely will have many creases. It will look like it's been working. So when you get the idea, it affects the vessel, even the physical brain. Ideally, of course, if you had both. If you had an easy and natural flow of great ideas and you had a very refined and clean vessel, in which to house it, you would be a very smart person. The ultimate genius, and only few people were given this uh, compliment, the ultimate genius would be someone in whom all the potential knowledge of his soul is available to the vessels of his mind. Which means there's no resistance in either the flow or the retention. Nothing impedes the flow of knowledge from his soul or from the source of knowledge. We'll get to it in a second. Nothing impedes it. it. It flows easily and naturally. And the vessel is so clean and so pure, it loses nothing. That would be a person who is intelligent to the degree of intelligent potential. He's as intelligent as a person can be. That doesn't happen too often. I don't know who measured this, but you know the, the statement that we only use 10% of our brain. Who measured that? Another joke this guy says, did you hear that? Somebody said that we only use 10% of our brain. Look at it, with 10% of our brain, we're doing pretty good. Imagine if we used the other 70%. <laughs> Who measured this 10%? But whatever it is, whether it's 10 or 15 or 20, the point is, who uses and, and actually has access to the full potential of human intelligence? Not too many people. Now to the uh, meat of the subject the largeness or the smallness of the brain will describe or measure the, the intelligent capacity of the individual. Whether it's pure intelligence, not connected to emotion, or whether it's largeness and capacity, but it has to do with intelligence. There's another idea about the size of the brain, and that is that no matter how intelligent a person is, even the one who is intelligent to the maximum degree of intelligence, still intelligence is a finite experience. So by very definition, a brain is a finite thing. 
It has its limit, even if it's the biggest brain. But a big brain is not infinite, which would mean something like this. You can overload the brain with too much excitement or too much information, just like you can overload the heart with too much emotion, too much excitement. There are times when the mind receives or perceives, doesn't actually receive it, but it perceives ideas or awareness of things that it can't handle. It's completely beyond the capacity of the mind. Uh, for example, a person sees a miracle. It doesn't compute. He can't, he can't grasp it. He can't get his mind around it. So it makes him crazy. It blows his mind. And that's because the mind is a finite thing. But a human being is not. Well, not as finite as his mind. And the same is true with the heart. So let's examine this idea. <clears throat> On Rosh Hashanah, when we coronate God for the coming year, the tool we use is the shofar, a simple ram's horn that makes a simple sound, nothing sophisticated. In fact, it's because the sound is so simple that the shofar is used. The simple sound is supposed to express the sound that a person makes when he is overwhelmed beyond control. It's supposed to be a cry. What does it mean when a person cries? Usually, when we experience something, we discover something, we are, we are told of something, we immediately process the information through our mind. Does that sound familiar? Have you ever heard that before? Have you heard anything similar? Um, does it appeal to you? Does it shock you? Do you like it? Do you not like it? You process it very quickly through the mind. And you come away with an opinion. I agree. I don't agree. I want more. I want less. What happens when you're faced with something that your mind can't handle? Here's what happens. Every activity means movement. An emotion is a movement. Understanding, knowledge, thinking, it's all movement. Different attributes have different directions in which they move. So for example, the mind moves upwards. That's its direction. It wants to know what is above. It wants to know what it doesn't know. It gets bored repeating the same thing. The mind hates belaboring a point. OK, I got it. Well, did you like it? Yeah, it's a great idea. Well, if it's a great idea, let's say it again. No, it's not like a song where you sing it again. I got it. I understand it. I don't want to hear it again. I want to hear what else? What else? Tell me something I don't know. That's the direction of the mind. It moves upwards, which is also why it's objective. Upwards means away from this context. If you stay stuck in this context, you're not moving upwards. Emotions, on the other hand, move downwards. The nature of emotions. We love things that are smaller than us, we admire things that are bigger than us. But love goes downwards. Pleasure goes everywhere. So if we had to describe what is the direction or the movement of pleasure, the word that describes pleasure is expansive. Pleasure goes everywhere. When a person experiences a deep, satisfying pleasure, where does he experience it? In his brain? In his heart? In his body? In his wallet? <laughs> Where? Everywhere. 
everywhere. That's the nature of pleasure. It is expansive. In fact, the, the Gemara says that when you get good news, very pleasurable news, your bones expand. You can't get your shoe on or off, depending on whether you were wearing it or not. That is the nature of pleasure. It makes you feel expansive. It opens you up. It expands you. What would be the opposite of pleasure? Pain. What is the direction of pain? Pain is the opposite of pleasure. It contracts you. It makes you feel small. And if the pain is intense, then the contraction is intense to where it actually hurts. You feel your heart is being squeezed, compacted. The brain feels squeezed. So this is the difference between pleasure and pain. Pleasure expands, pain contracts. In both cases, an interesting thing happens. The expansiveness of pleasure is the nature of the soul itself. It's not so much a faculty of the soul, it's the soul itself. Parts of it, something similar, can happen in the emotions and in the mind. There are times when your mind feels expansive. It feels open, ready to take on any subject. Tell me anything. I'll get it in a second. My mind is alert. My mind is awake. It's, it's, it's feeling good. It is expansive. And then there are times you wake up and your mind is just clogged. It's contracted. It doesn't want to be bothered with an idea. brain fag. The heart also is that way. There are times when the heart feels expansive, like at a time of joy. Your heart is so full, it takes up all the room in your chest. And then there are times when the heart feels contracted. Any little emotion is too much. It bothers the heart. Leave me alone. I can't. I don't want to feel anything. Determining factor when is the mind expansive? When it has a little bit of pleasure. And pleasure brings the expansiveness. Because that's the nature of pleasure. When is the heart and mind contracted? When it feels no pleasure. Which means this. All expansiveness comes from pleasure. When there will be pleasure in the mind, the mind will feel expansive. When there's pleasure in the heart, the heart will feel expansive. Similar to something else we spoke about, that the mind is humble. So wherever the mind goes, it will bring humility. It will introduce humility. So if you bring intelligence to your emotions, your emotions will become humble as well. If you bring intelligence to your will, your will will be humble. Because humility comes from the mind. Expansiveness comes from pleasure. Wherever the pleasure will go, it will bring expansiveness. When you have an overwhelming pleasure, then you feel expansive all over. Your whole system is on maximum energy. So expansiveness, in its truest sense, is an activity of the soul itself not one of the powers or faculties or attributes of the soul. It's the soul itself. And this makes sense, by the way. Every faculty has its limitation. If it's intelligence, well, then it's only intelligence. Can't go beyond that. If it's emotion, then it's only emotion. It's almost like intelligence exists by its limitation and definition. It is intelligent because it's only intelligent. That's the property that makes it what it is. Emotion is emotion 
because it's only emotion. You start patching and mixing emotion with intelligence, you can make, end up with a mess. Then your mind is not a mind, your heart's not a heart, you're just completely fablungent. Only the soul itself, that is not a particular faculty, can have total expansiveness. Because what's going to limit it? It's a free agent. On the other hand, when you experience real pain and your system is contracted intensely, painfully contracted, in an inverse way, that too touches the essence of the heart, of the soul itself, beyond any of the faculties. So there are actually two ways of getting to the soul. One is through a high degree of pleasure, and the other is through a high degree of pain. This is why when you have a sadness or a pain, you cry. Why don't you speak intelligently? Why can't you say what bothers you? Because speaking is much too limited. Words are much too limited to convey the amount of pain you're feeling. So the outlet, the expression for that kind of pain, is a simple sound with no words or letters. The reason for that is simple. Words and letters come from the mind. When you have that degree of pain, your mind is overwhelmed by its own contraction. It is so tightly contracted, it can't think. If it can't think, it can't produce words. And even if it produced words, the words would be meaningless compared to the pain that you're feeling. So how do you express that kind of pain? You scream. You make a sound. No words, no letters, no intelligence. Not even emotional intelligence. Like, I hate this. This is killing me. That's not very intelligent. It's emotional intelligence, emotional words. But even the heart can't produce words. So you cry. But there are three kinds of crying. There's a cry that comes from an objection by the mind or heart. If that's what's happening, then the crying will not be so simple. It's like the, the example given um, when a child is in big trouble and he cries out, Mommy, the word is not really that important. The child is not really trying to identify his mother. It's a, it's a call for help. So the word is not that significant. It's the tone. It's the desperation in the voice. Now what happens when you express that kind of pain is that the expressing of it softens the pain. Once you've had a good cry, you feel better. Why? The crying creates a certain expansiveness. Giving off sound, making noises, is an act of expansiveness. You're feeling so contracted that it's painful. If you can make some noise, if you could shed some tears, that's expanding. Or they call outlets, it's uh, cathartic. You get it out and you feel better. But when the cry comes from the soul itself, then it's a completely different cry. It is the cry of the heart. And it's possible that it makes no noise. The first level of crying makes no words because it's too, too painful. The second kind of crying not only can't produce words, it might not even be able to produce a sound because it's the heart crying, not the mind or the emotions. It's the cry of the soul. 
that pain can be expressed in tears or in, in, or in a cry, but the cry will not release any of the pain. There will be no relief from that crying. During the year, we're supposed to serve God. We're supposed to give God satisfaction and pleasure. How do we do that? We do the mitzvahs. Every mitzvah you do, you're giving God satisfaction with his creation. He created the world for a purpose. It's happening. He wants people to move upwards and devote their life to something higher, to his purpose, to his vast eternal plan. When people do that, it gives God pleasure, of course. But on Rosh Hashanah, we have to get to God's essential pleasure. Because every year, God, in a sense, reconsiders the creation in general. On the anniversary of the creation, God reconsiders. Does he really want a world for another year? Does he really want to be the king for another year? Now, of course, he is going to be king because he's not giving up on his project. And even if nobody ever blows the chauffeur, there will still be a world next year. The question is, if God is going to be our king next year, will he find pleasure in it or no pleasure? And we don't mean little pleasures. We mean God's ultimate pleasure, which is what moved him to create the world in the first place. Will he have that pleasure this coming year, or will he keep the world going begrudgingly? That's determined by the blowing of the chauffeur. And this is why. We're trying to get to God's ultimate expansiveness, which is divine pleasure. We can't match that pleasure. We cannot be that expansive. So how do we touch God on that level of pleasure? By feeling our pain. By having that contracted, painful feeling that we are far from God, we are, we're not worthy, we're not getting there, we're not what we should be, if that causes a squeezing of the heart, the opposite poles somehow affect each other. By having the ultimate contraction, we touch God in the source of his pleasure. The shofar starts narrow and ends up wide. That's the idea. Our pain will stir his pleasure. Our smallness will touch his greatness. The simple cry that is necessary on Rosh Hashanah is not just to satisfy God's plan. For that, doing a mitzvah is enough. That we do all year. You put on the tefillin, you satisfy God's need. You eat kosher, it's what God wants. On Rosh Hashanah, it's not enough. We have to reach the origins the source of God's pleasure. And the only way to reach that is by going to the opposite pole. And that's why we call it judgment days, days of awe, because we're going to face our smallness. And by admitting our smallness and feeling our smallness, we will release the ultimate expansiveness, even in heaven. So now let's apply it to the, to the workings of the mind. No matter how brilliant the mind is, no matter how large your emotional capacity is, it doesn't compare to the soul itself. It's a mere function of the soul. There are times when we need to touch the soul itself. If a person lives 120 years and is intelligent, is warm, is emotional, he's a, he's a real mensch, but he never touched the soul. 
or it never touched him, then he hasn't lived. It's, he, he is not a total human being because there's got to be more to a human being than his mind and his heart. The mind and heart are functions. What is the person himself? There are times when for no apparent reason, out of, out of nowhere, you suddenly feel terrible. I'm a failure, I'm no good, I'm worthless, I'm an embarrassment to myself, I'm a zero, and it's shocking. It shakes you up completely. And at that moment you realize you can't be this way anymore. It's over. The way I have been is gone. A new chapter begins, which is much more dramatic than I did something really stupid, I regret it, I'll try not to do it again. It's not something I did or didn't do. It's like reality exists in layers. You existed in a certain layer and you thought, oh, that's all there was and you were doing pretty good. Suddenly you discover that's just a layer. And that's no longer acceptable. And a whole new layer of life opens up. You've become a different person. Ideally, that's what we're supposed to experience on Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Simchas Torah. You shed some layer of reality and you move up to a higher level. Now this happens very often as a person gets older. You live your life, you're busy, you run, you try, you get, you make, you, you fail, you succeed, and then you get old. And you can't run. And the excitement is gone. And you look back at your life and it's just not acceptable. Just not, it, it's not a life. Now others will argue with you and say, what are you talking about? You had a pretty good life. And on that level, it's true. But from the perspective of standing outside of the rat race, you look back at it and say, that was life? I haven't even begun to live yet. Another way of putting it. Real growth is not a matter of increment. If a person does absolutely nothing but eat and sleep, and a year goes by, he's grown. Not only physically. He's grown emotionally. He has grown intelligently. Because every day is an experience. You got to learn something. So without any effort whatsoever, without any intention whatsoever, if you make it through the year, you're a year older, which means a year advanced. But in tiny increments, that's not called growing. That's called vegetating. A vegetable also grows. Human growth means you make radical changes, dramatic changes, not insane changes, but radical changes. You used to be a silly child. You've become a mature adult. That doesn't happen through small increments. There's got to be some radical shifts one of the ways that that happens is when a person first, the first time in their life, when a person first realizes something about me is absolutely unacceptable. Not disappointing, embarrassing, appalling. Appalling. When the person first experiences this realization, I did that, that's appalling. Which is a very different from, oh my, am I embarrassed. Uh. 
I'll try to do better. No. Appalling means it's over. Never again is that going to... That's appalling. That's when a person begins to be mature. You cannot claim to have matured. You can't claim to be mature if you have never had the experience of being appalled by something in yourself. Because when you're appalled, then the layer is peeled away and you're into a new layer. If you grow only by increment, you never get past the first layer. You're just stretching the layer you're in. To break through into a new dimension of life, there's got to be this intense rejection. I've got to get out of here. Then you start to grow. Why do you have to get out of here? Not because there is something so pleasurable that you have to have it. That doesn't do it. Our pleasure is not that expansive that it will blow the lid off our, off our uh, layer of, of existence. But the pain will. So when we find something in ourselves that is so appalling, you can't even scream. You can't even cry. There will be tears because the, the brain can't handle it. But those tears don't express what you're feeling and that's why they will not make you feel better. They bring no relief. So, why did God create us with these two extremes? Capable of ecstatic pleasure and also vulnerable to extreme pain, emotional pain. They are two sides to the same coin. A human being exists within a box. That's your life. The extreme expansiveness means moving beyond the box, expanding, not being stuck in the box. But that's on this side, the right side, the pleasure side. On the left side, or the lower side, there is the pain. And the pain can be so intense that it takes you out of the box. The box is no longer acceptable. So here are the two possibilities. You will either move into a whole new realm of existence because the pleasure is so expansive that it took you beyond your limits, or you will break out of the box and be able to experience something completely new because the pain could no longer accept the box. This is what tshuva means. It's not translated repentance. But repentance just means a, a regret. This is much more than a regret. Regret does not touch the soul. It only hurts the heart. What we mean by tshuva on Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur, what does it mean? Today is a day of repentance. What kind of crazy idea is that? You sinned four months ago. <laughs> Today is the day of repentance. You should repent the day you sin. If repenting means regretting. And the fact is, after every sin, we do regret. Not enough to stop sinning, but enough to ruin our fun. So we're full of regrets. Anytime you've ever gotten into a fight with your mother, of course you regret it. You're not going to apologize. You're not going to go that far. <laughs> but you regret it. You do something you know you're not allowed to do. It feels good for the moment. The next moment you regret it. That's our nature. Unless we're so far gone we have no conscience at all. That's rare. But that kind of repentance can't be reserved for a certain day of the year. It doesn't make any sense. Today is a day of repentance. Well, what's today? The day of repentance, which is Yom Kippur, or the ten days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, it's not to regret your sin. That you got to do immediately. <laughs> you messed up, clean up. Don't wait four months later. 
the regret or the tshuva of Rosh Hashanah is the tshuva of the soul itself. The soul itself is, is shaken because it's the anniversary of, of creation. The issue is, will God have that kind of pleasure with his creation that he had when he first created it? That kind of pleasure cannot be approached. You can't even get close with a little regret or a little resolution for next year. That's, that's child stuff. To get to that degree of godliness, you have to get to that degree of soulfulness. So on Rosh Hashanah, when we face God and say, give us a good new year, we're not talking about little increments. We're talking new year. New, completely different. I was thinking, why do we start Yom Kippur with an annulment of all vows? You know, the holiest moment, the most awesome moment, Kol Nidre, with that famous song, with the... And what are we saying? What we're saying is all the vows I made last year are null and void. Is that the most important thing you can think of saying? And what does that have to do with being forgiven for your sins? So possibly one of the, one of the ideas behind it is you're going to make resolutions for the coming year. Of course, you made resolutions last year and the year before, and you haven't gotten around to them. So it's very likely you come to Yom Kippur and you say, you know what, what resolution will I make this year? Uh, actually, no, I'll just do what I resolved to do last year. Not acceptable. Not acceptable. And that's why we start Yom Kippur with, any resolutions I made last year are null and void. Erased, gone. I got to start all over again. I can't fall back on last year's inspiration. Can't say, well, I'll try it again. I resolved last year to give, uh, to give a lot of charity. I didn't do it last year. I'll try it again. No. You annul all the good vows you made. Last year's resolutions are gone. They're over. You've got to find new inspiration because the idea is to get to a whole new level of existence. So when we say, humble yourself and serve God, it feels like an attack. Humble yourself. Who do you think you are? It feels like we're being dismissed. It feels like we're being put down. It's really not that way, if we understand it properly. When Torah says you are insignificant, you are meaningless, you're a failure, you're a sinner, you're doomed, it's not a rejection of you. It's talking to your capacity to feel that disappointment, to be so appalled with yourself that a, that a whole new layer of you opens up. So when we say, humble yourself and just do what God says, stop trying to be a chacham. You're not going to outsmart God. God says that it's not good, don't do it. So what are you telling me? I'm stupid, I can't think for myself? No, on the contrary. It is a compliment to the human being that a human being can be dismissed. If there was nothing more to me than what I present, then don't you dare dismiss it. Then you've annihilated me. What you think doesn't matter. Oh, really? That's all I have is my opinion. If my opinion doesn't matter, there's nothing left to me. When Torah says, God got angry at the people and said, you're a stiff-necked people, I've had it with you, you're evil from the time you were born, it's a compliment. Because God is not trying to destroy us. So if it's possible to dismiss your intelligence, your emotions, your intentions, your everything. That means that beyond all of that, there is more to you. That's a compliment. It's constructive, not destructive, if it's said correctly. And that's why we have to be very careful when we criticize, 
even our own children. Are you criticizing because you're dismissing or are you criticizing because you're aiming for something better? Not something better from the child, something better in the child. That's what the chauffeur means. If I can get to that painful, narrow beginning, the mouth of the chauffeur, if I can make that sound, if I can give that cry that comes straight from the soul itself, because I've realized not that I have failed, but that I am nothing yet, then that little cry releases the expansiveness of the soul, and I end up at the other end of the chauffeur, which is the maximum wideness. That's what we mean by smallness of mind, bigness of mind. The bigness of mind is still not big enough. There also has to be the cry. I think this is one of the core philosophies of, of the Baal Shem Tov's teachings of Hasidus. The criticisms, the experience of failure and disappointment, the fact that we sin was always perceived as a destructive thing. If you don't do your mitzvahs, if you, you're going to die. The Baal Shem Tov came along and said, you're missing the point. You're missing the point. If you could really regret your sin on a level beyond the mind, where you're appalled, your mind becomes speechless, dumb, in view of your disappointment, then you're not going to die. You're going to start a bigger, better life because there's a whole new layer that is waiting to be experienced. That's the idea of chauffeur. And that's why the Baal Shem Tov invented the idea of doing tshuva, repenting, regretting, and being appalled by what you are and doing it with joy. Nobody ever thought of that before. How can you condemn yourself as a miserable failure and do it with joy? There's no joy in that. It's interesting, Yom Kippur is a time, you know, the day of judgment and the, the world hangs in the balance and it's called a holiday. You're not allowed to be sad. You've got to be serious, but you're not allowed to be sad. It's a holiday. We put on our Yom Tov finest, our best clothes, we eat a special meal. It's a festival. And that is possible because peeling away a layer of existence only opens up another one that's even better. This makes sense? A little bit? Somewhat? Yeah, I'm asking if it makes sense. What's the directive? It makes Let's see. Let, let's see what practical application we can have from this. The first thing is a student comes to his teacher and says, I'm stupid. I can't. Everybody else seems to understand the lesson. I don't understand it. I must be stupid. The teacher's first job is to discover where the problem lies. Is it that the child is not gifted in experiencing new ideas? Or does he have a sluggish vessel 
and it's hard for him to contain the ideas. Once you determine where the area where the problem lies, then you can approach it and try to do something to fix it. A student once said to the Rebbe, everything I learn, I forget. I tried to learn. I really want to, I want to be good. And he was a good student. But he didn't retain. A week later, he had forgotten. So the Rebbe said to him, what do you read in your free time? And he was very embarrassed because he read not such modest. So the Rebbe said, you can't have that and Torah in the same brain. You stop reading those magazines, you'll remember. Which means it wasn't that he had no memory. Some people have poor memory. He didn't have a poor memory. The, the vessel was not clean. So he cleaned up the vessel, his memory was fine. A student, I think we talked about this, a student sits in class and he wants to hear the lesson, he wants to know it. And after all, he came to learn. Every morning he comes with the intention of learning. So he sits there and the teacher says something about the commandment to honor your father and mother. And the student is thinking, I never heard that. I never heard that. I know about honoring your parents. I never heard you have to do that. He's lost the lesson. He's going to come away feeling that he didn't hear the lesson because he didn't. His mind went off on a tangent. Nobody asked you whether you've heard this before, so why are you thinking about that? The teacher is telling you that part of honoring your mother and father is to never ask them to do menial tasks for you. Did you hear that? And the kid says, no, I never heard that before. That was not the question. I didn't ask you, have you heard it before? I'm asking you, did you just hear what I said? And the kid says, yeah, but I never heard that before. He's not focused. That's one form of, of distraction. Another seemingly innocent form of distraction, the teacher says, honor your father and mother means don't ask them to do menial tasks for you. And he thinks to himself, whoa, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, right. Nasty, very nasty to call up your mother and say, run an errand for me. He missed the lesson. Nobody asked you whether you think it's a good idea. What is your mind occupied with? Thinking what a good idea it is. But nobody asked you whether you think it's a good idea. So again, you've been distracted. You were not absorbing. Not because you're not intelligent. Your vessel was filled with something else. You were thinking about how much you like the idea. How much you agree with it. Of course, the opposite is, you hear something you don't want to hear. You may not ask your mother to run a menial task. Well, but you work all day. You need your mother to go pick up the cleaning and, and feed the dog. So you don't want to hear this. So as soon as it comes out of your teacher's mouth, you're saying, no, no, it can't be. That, that's not necessary. That's already too much. You missed the lesson. So the teacher has to know, where is the student failing? Is it in the retention or is it in the original conception? What's the right way of hearing what your teacher has to say? By hearing. I'm making your mind blank, in a sense? In a sense, yeah. Not making your mind blank, making your vessel empty. So the real mindful way of learning is having only one impulse. I want to know. That's all. Don't analyze, don't agree, don't disagree, don't compare it to something somebody else said. Those are all distractions. Interesting, because when you're pregnant, um, your mind, it's very hard to remember things. You're always forgetting things, etc. And they say it's like a distraction of being pregnant. I, I mean, it, it's like I'm very
example. Well, I can't comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> I think what happens, and not only with pregnancy, but in other circumstances as well, there are times when you have something that you're busy with that is important to you, and because of it, everything else becomes unimportant. Unimportant. So it's not that you didn't hear, you didn't remember, you didn't understand. No. You weren't paying attention you're not interested. Now, before you were pregnant, you were interested. It was your favorite topic. It was your big thing. Now you're pregnant. you got other things. It's not important anymore. Somebody once asked this, this uh, memory expert, uh, why is it that I can never remember names? Something wrong with my memory? <laughs> so the expert said, um, do you want to remember the names? And he thought about it for a second. He said, no. <laughs> well, that's why you don't remember. <laughs> it's not you have a bad memory. You're not interested. The proof of it is anything you're interested in, you remember. So, so again, are you failing because your capacity is, or you're just not interested? What is the problem? You can't just lump everybody together. Uh, stupid. Not intelligent. Okay, so the first thing we get from this description of, of how the mind works is that some people might not have a problem with finding the idea. They have a problem with housing it. Some people may have a problem uh, getting the idea. They have no problem housing it once they get it. So you've got to know what you're dealing with. self Knowledge has got to be very helpful and, and uh, useful. But then, this thing with regret. We shortchange ourselves when we put these limits of either heart or mind on our existence. So, for example, you feel an emotion. And that becomes the extent of your reality. It's not good enough. You have an idea, an opinion, and that becomes the limit to your existence. That's not acceptable. Don't shut down. Stay open to what else there is. And just very simply, a person says, I am a rationalist. As far as I'm concerned, if it don't make sense, it don't exist. What, are you suicidal? Why would you cut off half of your life and be content with only the half you have left? There's so much more to you than what your mind can tell you, and you're not interested? Only a fool would do that. So what we're saying is, this fear of criticism the fear of embarrassment. I'm wrong? You really think I'm wrong? I can't, I, no, that can't be. I hate you, I'll never talk to you again. What happened? If we're not familiar with what else there is to us, the capacities that we have that we've never yet experienced, then we become very small. The feelings I have, that's all I have. If you try to take that away, I'm going to kill you. My opinions and what I know and understand, that's all I have. Don't you dare tell me I'm wrong. What are you trying to do, kill me? That's an insult to yourself. There is so much rich, good, powerful, beautiful stuff that the mind will never handle, and that the heart will never contain. And you're going to cheat yourself out of that? It's foolish. And again, this is why in the world of modern psychology, where the brain is the limit to the human existence, we've been cheated. We've been crippled. So when the Baal Shem Tov comes along and says, 
Don't you see the joy of regretting your whole life? Don't you see the potential that that brings? No wonder people have a hard time considering such questions. That's true. That's true. It was a shock to the system. That's why the Mishnah, I mean, now we'll understand it much better. The Mishnah says, if you really want to be a mensch, love criticism. How do you love criticism? Criticism is painful. It hurts. It's nasty. Why do you accept criticism from a friend? the same criticism that you would be deeply offended by if somebody else said it. Why? Because somebody else who's not your friend doesn't know that there's more to you than what meets the eye. If they reject what meets the eye, they're rejecting everything. Your friend, though, knows that there's more to you than what they're criticizing. And so when they criticize, it feels like a compliment. So when your best friend says to you, oh, don't be stupid, it's a compliment. Oh, you think I could be smart? I'm doing something stupid, but you think I can be smart. Oh, thank you. But when a stranger says, oh, stop being stupid, it means just stop existing, okay? All you are is stupid. <laughs> then it hurts. When God tells us to do tshuva, do you hear the compliment? Do you see it? God says, take a day off, or two days actually, take two days off, sit down, and regret the entire year. And make sure next year is better. Do you hear the compliment? It helps us get past the fear of regret. Because regret is such a good thing. How do you make real growth, giant steps, if you don't regret? If you can't jettison some part of yourself in favor of something better, how do you grow? How do you move? How do you take off and fly? You can't. So when, when God says, take a day in which you jettison everything, Regret down to the core. Strip everything away. Whatever you've learned, whatever you know, it's nothing. It's meaningless. You haven't even touched on the truth yet. And whatever you feel, what do you think? You love your parents? You call that love? You think you love your friends? You think you love your children? Come on. That's not love. That's indigestion. Can you handle that? Can you honestly look in the mirror and say, I haven't even begun. I've been a father. I've been a Jew. I've been a chassid. I've been a brother. I've been a son. No, not I wasn't good at it. I haven't begun to be it. Because what I thought being a Jew was, it's embarrassing, don't even ask. What I thought it meant to be a father, let's not even talk about it. I'm just now starting to realize maybe that there really is such a thing as a father. What I thought was a father is not a father, it's a joke. It's like when somebody says, so are you a good father? Are you a good father? If I say yes, yeah, pretty good father. Idiot. You idiot. You obviously don't know what a father is. You can't be good at it. It's an impossible task. It's like asking, so how far along have you gotten in your infinite journey? In an infinite journey, you don't get along. How far have you? N nothing. It's infinite. The same is true with being a Jew, being a chassid, being a husband, being a wife. It's, you can be good at it. Maybe you, maybe you don't know what. And that's when people come along and say, 
I'm not sure I'm ready to become a mother. I'm not sure I would be a good mother. Good. Now you can be a mother. If you think you're equipped to be a good mother, pity on your child. People are afraid to get married. Well, that's as it ought to be. Because if you know what getting married means, you better be afraid. And if you're not afraid, maybe you don't know what you're in for. You're taking on an infinite task. How can you not be afraid? Exactly. So why do it? This is what we're talking about. If we're, if we're in touch with what's real and true, then we're not afraid of infinite tasks. Because we're not thinking that we are limited to what our mind and heart can handle. We're not intimidated by it. If you peel away my whole life, there'll be another layer. And it'll be better. I guess that's what the whole, the introduction of, a, of the notion of a soul. You have a soul. I'm not talking about the godly soul. I'm talking about the human soul. But knowing that there is a soul behind these activities makes you infinite compared to what you were. If a human being is the sum total of his activities, we are miserable creatures. The good news is we are not the sum total of our activities. All our activities are rooted in a soul that is bigger than the sum of its parts. And there are moments when we can tap into that. <laughs>